This is part two of the spectroscopy interview with Ralph Sturgeon. In this part, Sturgeon discusses speciation, isotope analysis, and nanomaterial analysis. To hear his views on sample introduction for atomic spectroscopy and a discussion of his recent work on UV photogeneration as a sample introduction system, listen to part one. Speciation mm -hmm. of elements is important. Do you think the atomic spectroscopy community has realized this, that the chemical form of the element is at least as important as its concentration? And do you think that in the future we will see instrumentation dedicated to routine speciation analysis? Mm -hmm. I think the, the short answer to that is an unequivocal yes. Uh, we've seen significant advances in speciation, and a lot of that case, you can uh, attribute it directly to the work of the atomic spectroscopy community, and you can get a pretty good feeling of how fully this subject area has been entrenched by atomic spectroscopists in past years just by looking at the content of any international meeting, let's say even over the last 15 years. Uh, there's always one or more sessions devoted entirely to um, uh, speciation of metals. Other evidence uh, of, of the importance of this amongst atomic spectroscopists uh, in specifying the speciated form of number of elements is that uh, there is some legislation that has uh, taken place, and we can cite, for example, the need to measure chromium-6 as opposed to chromium you know, total chromium content in, in waters and soils in the United States. A number of years ago, butyl tins were um, banned from uh, paints for use in pleasure craft, and they're now monitored in sediments and waters. And even more recently, there's the metabolic significance of organoselenium compounds uh, in uh, nutraceuticals, although it's not mandated yet that they be, uh, they be measured. And, of course, there's the ever-present uh, toxicity of mercury. Everybody knows that the methylmercury or alkylated mercury species are are more important than total mercury to be measured. But all of these issues, uh, again, as I say, they've been uh, well recognized by the atomic spectroscopy community, and a further example of that is the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK. They have uh, promoted their journal, Metalomics, which has only been out for about three years now, but uh, it looks as though it's, it's uh, having a very strong impact and has uh, been well represented amongst the community. And, and that, in fact, was, uh, was led uh, by an atomic spectroscopy spectroscopist Joe Caruso from Cincinnati. So the community really is very acutely aware that development of strategies for, you know, complementary application of element and molecule specific techniques are needed and we can cite here such uh, techniques as ICPMS uh, in combination with uh, electrospray mass spectrometry or MALDI mass spec and uh, these especially the emerging field of metalomics and metalloproteomics for biology and life sciences are demanding this kind of, of measurement technique. Uh, as for the dedicated instrumentation, uh, I really think this area is pretty well served right now by online uh, hyphenated techniques that are currently available to everyone. And these are largely comprising a combination of various chromatographies to achieve the species separation and, the, and hence the temporal resolution of the metal at the detector. Uh, in addition to this, uh, and in connection with our previous questions, non-chromatographic, uh, chemically specific separation of species has also been achieved where we can use either selective extractions or even vapor generation techniques to um, target one particular species of, of, an, of a metal. But most researchers are well aware of the inherent problems of speciation when, uh, when we don't have standards that, uh, that really are able to identify all the species and we end up with unknown chromatographic peaks when we, when we apply mass spectrometry. Um, so there's a need to, to do this both online and offline to elucidate the identity of this molecular species. Uh, but in this connection, I'd, I'd like to cite at least one point, uh, and that's Gary Heafia and his colleagues. They've spent a number of, uh, of research and development years of effort going into the development of, of a dual-source time-of-flight mass spec system, which is designed for both uh, elemental ICPMS and electrospray MS detection of metals. So um, there, in addition to that, which, of course, is not commercially available yet, I guess Gary's hoping that it does, um, we have techniques uh, such as originally outlined by uh, Vahid Majidi many years ago, taking advantage of the temporally different energy environments in uh, pulsed glow discharges. And that work has been subsequently picked up by Alfredo Sanzmodel uh, in Oviedo, and, and Gary Heafy and his colleagues have also further exploited uh, these opportunities with glow discharge. Perhaps all of these efforts are going to 
lead to eventually cost-effective, robust approaches to a dedicated, uh, speciated instrumentation. But at this time, just to reiterate, I, I really do think that this diverse field is, is pretty well suited with a, a large complement of chromatographic techniques, which can be you know, just purchased off the shelf, independently optimized, and uh, coupled to specific detection platforms, rather than attempting a one-size-fits-all approach. But what has to be emphasized uh, to date is that most of the efforts here in the speciation field in the atomic spectroscopy research community have been driven by just that, research laboratories. And I think what it's going to take is more legislation to specifically request that species-specific measurements be made uh, before the larger number of private and contract laboratories jump on board. And these are the labs that could make use of potentially dedicated equipment for, uh, for when they make their accredited measurements. So, for example, uh, I've gone through the measurement of, uh, of a number of species, but uh, another example in Canada here, I know I don't know what's happening in other countries, but in Canada, of course, mercury is, uh, is well known to be a potential contaminant in seafood. And uh, what, the, uh, what, what, what is done in, environment, in Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is to make the reasonably valid assumption that all the mercury that's detected is predominantly in the form of the methyl mercury. And so... To date, only total mercury is still measured, but it's, um, it's, it, it's given as a substitute for, for the methyl mercury that may be present. But just to, to wrap up in general, I think we're probably pretty well served by uh, off-the-shelf instrumentation that's, uh, that's cunningly uh, adapted and uh, put together with uh, various uh, detection platforms, and uh, what's really needed to, to drive this thing forward is probably going to be more legislation in the future. Thanks. Isotope analysis <laughs> continues to evolve as an important tool for all kinds of applications, such as in forensics and geological dating. What is the most significant need for this community, and how do you see its future growth? Um, indeed, but, uh, isotope analysis is a very vast field of applications, and it, it ranges for even more than you presented here. Analytical chemistry, uh, right through the provenance of goods and forensics, medicine, geochemistry, cosmochemistry. Um, and as a result, there's many different mass spectrometer platforms that are, uh, that are deemed optimum for different applications. And these range from simple quadrupole-based instruments right up through single detector sector field designs for analytical work. Uh, then there's the dedicated gas sampling isotope ratio machines for such things as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, where we're making uh, delta values. And onto the multi-channel sector field devices, which include historically the TIMS devices, but now uh, including also ICP sources for the most demanding, accurate, and precise measurements that are important to the, the geochemical and the metrology communities. But the, the relatively recent availability of multi-channel sector field ICPMS machines is what's really opened up new research avenues in the field of stable element geochemistry, uh, because here they're finally discovering that there is mass-dependent and mass-independent fractionation effects ongoing for even many heavy isotopes, whereas before that was, uh, um, I guess, well studied for uh, light things such as uh, lithium and uh, magnesium. So we know how to make these uh, measurements in isotope uh, chemistry, and uh, we often do so in a fit-for-purpose world. Models uh, that are describing the response, and uh, especially those that are needed to account for mass bias uh, introduced by the instrument, are improving every year, and, and with them, of course, there's a concurrent improvement in the quality of the results. But I think the challenge for, uh, for some in the community is to make available more isotopic reference materials. These are materials that are certified for isotope abundance, uh, and they can be both uh, high-purity calibration materials or calibrants, as well as a real sample matrix materials that could be used in calibration itself. So the next challenge uh, is also one of education, I think, relating to the reporting of what we call combined uncertainties of the determined isotope amount ratios. And not just uh, what you tend to see most often in the literature now, uh, especially amongst geochemists who, who cite internal and external precisions that can be achieved. So I think both of these challenges, um, making available more isotope reference materials and making available better estimates of the uncertainties associated with the measured or determined uh, isotope ratios, um, uh, need to be done. And, and I think they can be handled in large part by uh, the metrology community, such as um, uh, institutes such as NIST and, uh, and our own NRC, which are contributing to these activities at present. 
A current concern today in environmental science is the effect of nanomaterials. Do you think this is the next great challenge for atomic spectroscopy? Uh, certainly, detection of nanoparticles in the environment is raising substantial interest uh, by a lot of people, but uh, and it's being met with enthusiasm from the atomic spectroscopy community, which, of course, is always looking for some new challenge. Um, we can just look at the uh, the most recent issue uh, of of uh, JAZZ, the Journal of Analytical Atomic Spectroscopy, which I happen to have on my desk here, and the entire issue is devoted to uh, detection of of nanoparticles by uh, analytical atomic spectroscopy, and there's a tremendous variety. Of of techniques that can be used to, to characterize these engineered nanomaterials, and they expand well beyond the norms of analytical atomic spectroscopy to include things like uh, um, OG emission and X-ray uh, photoelectron, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, thermogrammetric, Raman, uh, all of the microscopies, including atomic force and uh, TEM and SEM. Um, an example of uh, application here would be, you know, quantum dots and uh, silver nanoparticles. Uh, silver nanoparticles are are embedded in our underwear now and lots of garments for uh, their their uh, bio control. So uh, both of these are readily tackled with elemental analysis techniques. So they belong in the domain of atomic spectroscopy. But more often than not, they are uh, also looked at from uh, the point of view of their of their sizes, and so size separation systems are, are brought into play here. Uh, in addition to getting a compositional uh, atomic spectroscopy signature, we're looking at a, a physical signature in terms of particle distributions. Another case to look at is uh, single-walled carbon nanotubes. These are probably the fastest growing commercial additive to manufactured materials, and they may possess no outstanding elemental signature because they're carbon, uh, unless uh, they're characterized by uh, some concurrent residual catalyst content, which arises from the manufacturer. And hence, they're not really amenable to atomic spectroscopy detection, but we must rely instead on uh, separation techniques and physical particle characterization systems, such as light scattering or microscopic Im imaging, in order to locate and find them in environmental samples. But the real issue uh, regarding the challenge of, of finding nanoparticles in the environment, I think, uh, stems to uh, how to extract them and uh, separate the nanomaterials from, from the matrix under study. Uh, here, uh, just like we've seen with um, uh, speciation, it's uh, going to likely be realized through some form of hyphenated technique involving chromatography. And I think it's very clear that the present, the family of uh, field flow fractionation techniques appears to be uh, probably at the forefront of all of this. But the, your general question also raises um, a lot of, you know, ancillary discussion and the unique properties that uh, nanoscale materials have means that they're likely to penetrate biological and ecological systems in novel ways that we that we haven't thought of before, and and this in fact has has brought about the emergence of this whole new field of nanotoxicology. And because of the widespread use of, of these materials uh, everywhere, even in medicine, uh, this has hastened their dispersal and, and presence in the environment. And the detection of these nanoengineered particles in the environment is, uh, is very relevant, uh, but uh, only because it's connected with the field of nanotoxicology. And if we go back and have a cursory look at this subject, area itself, we can find that uh, these earlier health and safety studies that have targeted mammalian and uh, other species toxicity, toxicity data are very often dubious because they've been unsupported by controlled experiments and uh, without consideration of how the nanoparticles themselves behave in the biological systems once, once they're into the system. And uh, there's a lack of characterization even of the particles either outside the system or even when they're in the system. And, and so People really don't understand yet fully the, um, the structure activity relationships that, that come from uh, what would be classical chemical toxicology. So the principles of, of the classical chemical toxicology are not directly useful to these studies since it's a physical entity with potential chemical effects that's actually being transported. And it's, it's only recently that toxicologists have really become aware of the need for a full characterization of these test materials before they deployment deploy them in their talk study and conclude whether the nanospecifics of the material itself is responsible for these effects or it's something else peculiar to it. 
So um, I'd like to, to, to say that our laboratory and obviously others are working towards providing relevant reference materials for these studies uh, that will provide well-characterized uh, materials for talk studies, which have been characterized both from their physical and chemical uh, uh, points of view or their attributes. So I guess I'd like to summarize to say I, I wouldn't be tempted to say that uh, the, the measurement or the determination or detection of nanoparticles in the environment is, is really the next major challenge for atomic spectroscopy, but I would certainly be tempted to tuck it into the category of uh, further aspects of speciation. Cause, uh, and I'm confident that there will be significant advances in this field considering these real or even perceived impact of uh, nanoparticles on health and safety. But these advances may be hopefully more rapidly gained than were those of our typical small molecule speciation problems because uh, they won't be driven by curiosity, but hopefully by potential legislation. Dr. Sturgeon, thank you so much for talking to us today. Laura, it's, uh, it's, um, it's been my great pleasure, and you're most welcome. Thanks again for the invitation. I, I much appreciated discussing these wide-ranging uh, topics.